Hi there, I'm Raghi Oman. Welcome to this, our brand new program, Young, British and Muslim. We're going to be discussing some of the most talked about topics and hear stories of young British Muslims trying to make a difference every day. And you too can be part of that conversation, so do take part at hashtag YBMITV on Twitter. Keep it clean, keep it friendly and respectful. Now each week we'll discuss a topic with the help of three guests here with me in the studio. And this is who's joining us this week. Thanks all for coming in. Um, but before we kick off, uh, as it's our first episode, we wanted to look at why we're here and the state of the British Muslim community. There are an estimated 4 million British Muslims in the UK. Now that's about 6% of the population, double what it was almost 20 years ago, with Islam being the second largest religion nationally, having been here for centuries. Today, the British Muslim population is a very young one, with almost 50% under the age of 25 and almost 90% under the age of 50. Now, you three are here today because you've all broken the mould in your own uh, different ways. Um, let me start with you first, uh, Tez. Now, how did someone who's studying biochemistry yeah. get to be a stand-up comedian? How did that change come? And what did your parents say when you told them that I'm actually going to go from perhaps being a biochemist to being a comedian? Well, yeah, so I studied biochemistry at university, did a master's in management, then came to London. To, mm -hmm. I got on the graduate uh, programme in the civil service. So I ended up at the Home Office in Whitehall. Wow. So far, so good. Parents are very happy, doing yeah. a very respectable job. And then I was kind of in London. I was looking for a hobby in the evening, something to do. Mm. And I came across a stand-up workshop. And my friends always told me I was funny. I believed them, because that's the sort of person I am. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's just something that I can do with myself in the evenings, meet new people, maybe make a fool of myself. I can live with both of those things. Yeah. And I, got, I was bitten straight away. I was just bitten by the bug, the need right. to perform and the need to like, express the ideas that I'd, been, I'd had in my head for all these years. I am Muslim as well, um, so I've got all of that going on. Um, <laughs> for those of you that don't know that much about us, um, you might recognise us from such hit TV shows as the news, okay, because we... <laughs> and nothing like that in, in your family, you know, background? You haven't no. had any sort of uncles or no, aunts or doing like anything that. like that? No, I mean, I come from Blackburn in Lancashire and I know more people who, from my community in Blackburn who've been to prison than who work in the arts. Right, <laughs> really, that's <laughs> so, so it's a very, very different, like, the idea of, if someone at school had told me, oh, you become a stand-up comedian when you're older, you might as well have said to me, you become an astronaut. It was that far away from, yeah. from, what, I, from what I grew up in. And how did you find the industry? I mean, being young British and Muslim and getting into sort of comedy, and of course, with all the politics around mm. that whole issue, I mean, um, was, it, was it more of a challenge for you because you were young, you know, a, a, a stand-up comedian who was also Muslim? I mean, did you feel you had to address certain issues? Well, when I first burst on the circuit, I found it quite easy because I've got a unique USP within the comedy world, within the arts. Mm. I could talk about things that hadn't previously been expressed on a stand-up comedy stage in this country before. And that was really, really good because audiences really took to that and they thought, oh, here, here's someone who's talking about things that we see in other spheres, like in, in the news, for example, mm -hmm. but in the arts and stand-up comedy, we won't really hear mm -hmm. about it. And that, was, that made it, I think, a bit easier for easier. me. Maria, I mean, you broke the mould equally um, by being the first model to, you know, undertake a national sort of campaign for a major brand um, wearing a, a headscarf. How, did, was that your idea? Did it, was it part of the campaign that you're working on? Tell us, tell us how that happened. Um, similar, I had no plans on becoming a model at all. I just graduated uh, from English and history mm -hmm. and I was still managing a children's shop part time and I just got scouted and they asked me if I wanted to be part of a campaign for H&M. They needed to show more diversity, mm -hmm. wanted a girl in a hijab. I thought, cool, I'll probably make more money in a day doing that than I would. <laughs> and I completely forgot about the campaign. And the day it came out, uh, it was like, oh, Maria Drissi, the world's first hijab wearing model. It was big. Yeah, big and I was news. like, really? Because I just thought they wouldn't even notice me because there were so many people in the campaign. But because they had never had a woman in a hijab represented in a fashion campaign, that's why. 
It and what did, it, what did you deal. think when, when, when you came across the reaction? I don't know if you guys remember it. I mean, at the same I, time when I, it sort of Yeah, I do. I do. You do. It was big. Oh, that's yeah. nice. So, I mean, did you, did you, how did you react when all the attention was because you were, you know, in a major fashion shoot and wearing a, a hijab? It was mixed. Mm. I, I, it was kind of like, okay, what do I do now? Do I continue on this path mm. and milk it? Or do I just <laughs> go back and, you know, pursue what I wanted to do with my career, like in studying? Mm. Um, yeah, I milked it. And <laughs> <laughs> but, I, yeah, yeah, I haven't forgotten what yeah. I originally wanted to do. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Mohammed, with your um, work in, in music and in rap, I mean, you've tried to sort of break the mould, not only in terms of, you know, the music that you're trying to do, but also just the different groups you've tried to bring together. I mean, you know, uh, um, you know, you tell us about the different sort of uh, groups, because you, there was one group that you brought together, which was, I mean, Muslim and Jewish uh, and Christian rappers, or, you know, yeah. whatever you want to call it. I feel that uh, music is a universal language mm. and it has the ability to bring people from different communities. So one of the projects was a project called Lines of Faith, where it was myself and a Jewish rapper, and we looked at similarities between both of our faiths. And it wasn't just to do with music, but we would take the, uh, that art form to various schools and deliver a lot of educational workshops with youngsters from different backgrounds addressing those things. So it was a good way to educate them by using arts. Listening to the three of you, though, the one thing that sort of comes across is just, you know, from, you know, arts and comedy, fashion, music, it's just a reminder of we keep talking about how integrated are British Muslims and you're taking part in things that are just every day and showing just how in some ways ridiculous that conversation is. Would you agree? Absolutely. I think one of the best ways to showcase a community, mm. humanity, is through the arts. And so the more Muslims that can, we can get into the arts, the more we'll humanise our entire mm. community, even though it is very, very different communities. But I think that's really important. But did, when we talk about sort of breaking the mould, you all sort of have broken the mould to some extent within the sort of community and within families. Mm. I mean, how did your family, Tez, react? I mean, you know, initially they must have thought, oh, God, you know, <laughs> what? <laughs> what is he initially, doing? I think it was a bit of a double take. So, you're doing what? Um, like, <laughs> are, you, are you even funny, though? So that was, that was the kind of thing. Yeah. But slowly but surely through main more mainstream success. I think particularly mm -hmm. when I was in Man Like Morbin, which was a big hit yeah. um, r recently, they've kind of really accepted it now. Mm -hmm. And I had a big homecoming show last Friday where yeah. some family were in and- yeah, how, was really it, how was it being, uh, having to perform as a stand-up oh, comedy, which as you were saying, is a very raw art yeah. form and having, uh, you know, your, your parents or your, brothers, sisters, whoever, your whole family there, must have been. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's the most nerve wracking experience you can go through. <laughs> however well that show goes, that's what, they, they, that's what they think it's going to be like all the time. Yeah. So if it goes incredibly well, they think, oh, it must always go incredibly well. Mm. Whereas if it's flat or if it's bad, they think, like, this guy's wasting his time. Do you get Islamophobia, <laughs> I mean, in, in the professions you're working in? I mean, or is it, is it not so much an issue? I mean, barriers or sort of, you know, or has it been a plus, the fact that you're all sort of, you know, uh, you know from this background? I think for me, it's been a plus in that because I was talking earlier about having a USP, having yeah. this unique perspective yeah. that I can talk about on stage, which not a lot of other comics in this mm. country share. Mm. I think that's definitely helped me navigate some certain shortcuts. Mm. But at the same time, if there were people trying to hold me back, mm. I think people are now smart enough mm. to not say that that is the reason. Yeah. So I don't want to yeah. be the boy who cried wolf about it. Maria, what about yeah. you? I mean, um, have, you, have you faced... Have you lost some sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, campaigns mm. as much as gained some by wanting to wear a hijab as a model? Yeah. Do you know, on a personal note, I've never experienced any Islamophobia or racism, fortunately. But when I entered fashion, that's when I realised, OK, I don't think it's um, intentional racism or Islamophobia. It's just out of pure ignorance. And mm. I did have an experience where um, there was a very big deal that I was about to go through. And one of the outlets I needed to sign it off refused on the basis that oh, we think Maria wearing a hijab is going to limit the audience because she's a Muslim and for me it was this like this was a campaign for a for a British this is like uh, it was a collaboration with a with a, a beauty brand so I was quite shocked that that outlet refused on the basis that I wore a hijab nothing to do with my personality the way I just the fact that I wear a hijab they thought that their audience wouldn't buy the product and wow. for me it was like well I buy things that you know white girls that are wearing, you know, or black, like it makes no difference. So I was a bit, yeah, I was That's a bit shocked. Story. Um, Mohammed, how about you in the music uh, uh, industry? I mean, would you say that there have been times that, you know, being young, you know, and, and, and Muslim has, you know, put barriers up or, or has, uh, have you, has that not happened? I feel that sometimes people can uh, 
try and put you in a box and almost mm. like, oh, what you do is religious music. Right. And especially because my name is Mohammed Yahya. I'm not just a Muslim, but the name is yeah. so automatically they can think like that. But I'm able to create music which is for Muslims, for Jews, for Christians, for atheists, for whoever. I'm just trying to create high quality music. Mm. Yeah, I feel you, man, because sometimes I often get described as a Muslim comedian, yeah. mm. or an Asian comedian. Mm. So I'm a comedian mm. who is Muslim, mm. who That's right. is Asian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, I mean, you're all sort of, you know, successful in your own fields and you've you know, going to have long careers, you know, uh, sure. inshallah. Um, uh, what about, have you noticed other young sort of British Muslims trying to follow in the same footsteps? I mean, and, and what's your observations? I mean, uh, with the new generation, do they, do, they, do they see things differently to you? Are they, are they conscious of being Muslim and trying to make it in fashion, for example, Maria? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it did start this awakening. Mm. Um, one, in the fashion world, and then two, like, in the Muslim community as mm. well. So a lot of, I think, young girls who didn't ever think there could be an opportunity to work as a model. Um, now, obviously, there's, we've seen so many new hijab wearing models come out since Absolutely. then. Um, Nike's doing hijabs, like all this, th it's like a domino effect. Yeah. It just takes one thing to just open up the okay, doors. Cool. So there's definitely been a positive response, yeah. Okay, we'll talk of positive responses. We wanna move on to the next bit in our uh, program because um, one of the things that we want to sort of do, of course, first of all, is to continue the conversation. So as I was saying earlier, do join us on hashtag YBM uh, ITV uh, on uh, Twitter, but do keep it respectful um, and, uh, and nice. Um, now, each week we want to try and highlight uh, inspiration young people from around the country who are achieving great things and making a difference in areas not heard about. And here's our first story. We're the pop stars that we never got to see growing up. The Tuts represent a background that isn't usually represented in your mainstream media. If I had, have had um, Muslim role models, like if there were more Muslims in, in mainstream media, if there were more women of colour and more pop stars that looked like myself, maybe I wouldn't have rejected my culture and my roots and tried to fit in with white people so much. But I think me existing as a Muslim woman, holding a guitar, playing music, being on stage is a statement in itself. Like I always knew that music is what I wanted to do. I, the band is what I want to do. There wasn't anything else I could think of that I really wanted to do apart from music. But I got into pharmaceuticals quite early on. So I was working for pharmaceutical companies and I was a drug rep. And I was living this double life, um, earning like quite a good salary, but then coming home from work, rushing, getting out of my office clothes, putting on my, my outfits for gigs in the evening, running out the door. So I was living this double life. And after a while, when you're living a double life, it's really draining on your mental health. I did take a year out actually, and my mum kind of freaked out a bit. Like, what do you mean you're gonna quit your job? And I was like, well, I wanna make my album and I wanna put everything into my album. I think with South Asian parents in general, they don't really take arts seriously. Like they see the band as more of a hobby rather than an actual career. And I don't, I think, I don't think until I start making actual like money from my music and making a living off it, I don't think they're gonna take it like 100% seriously as a career but they are proud of me i think my parents view success in terms of money and how much money you're making but for me success is about the people that i'm empowering i want to use my platform to reach out to more girls more teenage girls more people from different backgrounds from minorities people who haven't been represented in the mainstream media i want young Muslim girls, brown girls, lots of different people to just look at us, look at me and be like, I can do that, I want to play guitar. She's really doing something that I'm scared to do and I really hope to empower these people. And that's the story of Nadia Javed and we're back with our guests uh, in the studio this week from Mohammed and Maria and Tez. Um, what did you make of uh, Nadia's story? She's quite a powerful Yeah, very inspirational. Woman. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you met her, we yeah. both met her in fact. And um, what did you make of that story? Because one of the things that sort of came up uh, actually that was really sort of interesting to me was um, her wanting to inspire mm. other sort of young girls and to see, you know, that this is something that they can sort of do as well. And we were talking earlier about how it just takes one thing to sort of break the dam. Yeah. And you've noticed, you know, lots of other sort of models coming to wear sort of mm -hmm. hijabs. Is that something that you've... Mm -hmm 
is people following in in that kind of footsteps do you think yeah i think i mean she's got so so much sincerity when she mm. talks so i think mm. that's what's going to draw people towards her yeah. and yeah she's a lovely person so yeah. i wish i wish there's so yeah. much success yeah. <laughs> is it a thing though when we're talking about being held back about how f you know people's families perceive you know people breaking the mold because you know <laughs> comedy fashion rap and not the kind of things certainly speaking about my you know family background that you say go for it you know yeah. become, become a become a stand-up comedian or whatever do you think there's a, a a sense of you know be a doctor be a you know lawyer kind of I, th I think that's a trope that is certainly still true mm. but part of it I don't really blame our parents for because mm. when they I can speak for my own family yeah. they've probably been in this country for like 50 years when mm. my granddad came he worked in textile mills in the north mm. he made money to send back to his family in Pakistan so they can live a better life he didn't mm. come here mm. to work in the arts and so when <laughs> and so there was a big focus <laughs> on kids that they had that they would go and do good jobs. They get they get mm. well educated, and that meant certain mm. um, professions. Whereas now we're third generation kids, yeah. we now have that freedom because of the hard work that our parents did mm. to maybe explore something a little bit different, mm. and hopefully it'd be even different for the generation below us because their parents would be more like us to mm. say actually yeah, if you want to go and make music, if you want to go and do comedy, or if you want to go and draw. Go and do that yeah. because you don't have to. Success doesn't mean you're a doctor or an engineer. But, but part of that is making sure that these kind of stories like Nadia's mm. sort of get out there. Do you feel that when you talk about the mainstream media, the, you know, these kind of success stories aren't covered enough within the sort of British Muslim community? I believe so. Yeah, I, I agree. They're definitely not being covered mm. enough and they need mm -hmm. to. And we need people like her to inspire and empower other young women so that they can continue that legacy. Mm. Yeah, because the problem is always still about first them being a Muslim and then pigeonholing us. So it's mm. like, oh, we're a mainstream media outlet. We can't talk about this community, but sure. this community is part of the mainstream. So it's yeah. like you can't pick and choose mm. exactly. who gets to be aired and who doesn't. Yeah. And I think there's still a, some way to go in this country to diversify mainstream arts. Yeah. I think America does it a little bit better. A little bit better, yeah. Um, you, you look at their TV shows and they give yeah. you a wide breadth of what Mm. America is like so when yeah. you go there you think yeah this is kind of what I see on TV yeah. Yeah. showcases America whereas yeah. I think when they look at our TV it's still down to Nabi yeah. Yeah. and those sorts of things so I think yeah. when I went to America they were certainly surprised that I was English mm. like but you don't look English yeah. <laughs> they, don't, they don't see me on TV they don't yeah. see me on TV yeah. whereas I know there's black people in America I know there's Hispanic people in America because mm. I see them on TV what about I mean being a Muslim and and this whole question of music I mean there's a lot of you know, stereotypical sort of views that the two don't sort of mix. Did you face, I mean, difficulties from within the community saying, you know, if you're a Muslim, what are you doing sort of rapping? Or is that, is that, a, yeah. is that a stereotypical thing to say? I think it's, it's an argument that's always taken place for mm. centuries yeah. between scholars. So it's a great area. Some people decide to keep away from music. Some people are involved in music. So when I first converted to Islam, I took a little break just because I was trying to find myself and trying to be as sincere as I could and try to follow the religion properly. And then I realized that it wasn't like black and white. Mm. So I navigated until I found a place where I felt comfortable. So I decided to mm. continue creating the music. And uh, I mean, uh, the concerts and, and the sort of invitations to sort of, you know, come and play. Mm -hmm. Again, they're from sort of many different sort of walks of life or, you know, different communities. Absolutely. There are many different communities. It's actually funny because when I did perform at... Um, events that were organized by Muslims, a lot of times they would come up to me and they'll say, uh, we really like your, your, your music, however, this is a very conservative audience, so you can perform, but you can't do any songs about this subject and that subject and that subject, <laughs> and you can perform, but make sure you don't move too much, and can you please do it without music? So I'm like, really, you're saying that you like me, but you clearly want someone else. Yeah, yeah, so if you yeah, either yeah. take me as I am or you, you, you won't, I won't perform. But I feel that that has changed now. And I was actually quite surprised because recently I was asked to perform at an event um, in Manchester. And I was actually out speaking to the organizers and they were like, no, we want you to perform with music. And I still wasn't sure. So then I asked the audience, would you prefer me to do a spoken word piece or mm -hmm. some stuff with music? And they were like, no, do stuff with music. So I feel that it is changing. So this is much yeah. about... It educating or changing the sort of um, the, the, the viewpoints of, of people within the community. Because mm -hmm. of course, yeah. you know, this, that's the other thing that it's, I find frustrating is that you say British Muslims and it's like one monolithic sort of block. There's 101,000 exactly. of different exactly. ways that people practice the faith, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But do you think that that's part of what role models, you know, people trying to break the mold should do is as much about 
wider Britain, but also about the community yeah. itself. And I think it comes down to choice. Mm. If you want to choose to live a more conservative, mm. you call it traditional way of life, yeah. that is fine, that's up to you. Mm. But don't force that on anyone else. Mm. And if exactly. someone wants to break the mold, mm. they want to maybe take a career that isn't stereotypically an mm. Asian or African career, mm. then they should definitely be encouraged to do that as well. Don't go away, because um, someone speaking of uh, breaking the mould who has done that uh, for young British Muslims is Saida Varsi. Now, growing up in West Yorkshire, she was a lawyer. And then in 2010, she became the first female Muslim woman to serve in the cabinet under David Cameron. She resigned in 2014 over the government's policy on the Israel-Gaza conflict. Baroness Varsi, who now sits in the House of Lords, has written a book called The Enemy Within about her experiences. I sat down with her and we spoke about identity and whether young British Muslim women are being held back and her hopes for the future for young British Muslims living in the UK. One of the things that I, I do in my book is have this two or three page rant about who are British Muslims. And I say that, you know, they're black, they're various shades of brown, they're your bog standard Anglo-Saxon, you know, they shop at various supermarkets, they have various professions, you know, they're everywhere. Uh, you know, the way in which they view Easter, how they celebrate Christmas, how how they get involved in, uh, in uh, bonfire night. So there's all these kind mm. of different ways in which I say they're folk like you and me. Uh, and each one of them is so different because of the various backgrounds or ethnicities or culture. And they or, practice Islam in very different exactly. ways. Exactly. And, and, and so one of the things that I talk about a lot now is not just the diversity amongst British Muslim communities, but allowing British Muslim communities to write their story in their way. Uh, what I do think, you mean by that? Well, uh, in, my, um, in my teenage years and probably even earlier, I mean, we go back 30, 40 years now, uh, there was an Urge Asian version of me which was acceptable to the home environment and then there was a outside the home non-Asian version of me or there was a professional version of me and the family version of me. You had to have lots of different identities of depending course. on where you were. And lots of people from ethnic minority backgrounds had mm. those various identities. Mm. Even change their name would have a shorter more anglicized name mm. when they were out and about uh, at work or with their friends. Um, and then I think you get to a certain age and certainly for me post 40 now in my late 40s now a grandmother I'm just grumpy and I can't be bothered to be anybody's version mm. of uh, me I'm going to be my version of me and that might be uncomfortable and it might make uh, some people feel like they can't quite put me within a box but then so be it mm. and and I really hope that we now have a generation of young British Muslims who are comfortably British comfortably Muslim and writing their stories in their way as long as in their stories they have choices Choices in the sense that, you know, this is the kind of young British Muslim, you know, man or woman that I want to be and people will just have to like it or leave it. Yeah, That's because you I don't, you know, I don't and want... And it's chosen to... by me rather than imposed exactly. by the community or by exactly. an imam or by my parents or by society or, you know, my exactly. white colleagues. Exactly. I, you know, I don't want the conservative mullah determining what kind of Muslim I have to be. And I don't want liberal intelligentsia in London telling me what kind of Muslim I want to be. Uh, I want to be able to have the choices mm. to be the kind of Muslim I want to be. And that could be super conservative, as long as that's what I've chosen to be. Or it could be super liberal. And I think we've got to stop uh, making judgments about people and having their story and their identity fit our narrative. Um, <laughs> let me ask you, um, in terms of, I mean, British Muslim women today, I mean, if you look back at the young Saeed of Varsi and being at university and becoming politicised and becoming a lawyer, um, one of the most uh, striking statistics is the extent to which British Muslim women are in one shape or form held back. However educated they are, um, more of them are sort of at home or unemployed. Um, what do you feel about that? I mean, in terms of the, the, the many different kind of constraints that hold British Muslim women back that might be to do with society, but also might be to do within the community. And this is why it's such a complex issue. And I think that's why I keep talking about choice. If Muslim women are choosing to stay at home because they want to be housewives or homemakers or principal carers for children and other relatives, that's fine. But if Muslim women are being held back, either by members of their family or members of the extended communities in which they live, or because of external pressures of racism and prejudice or not being given opportunities when they're applying for jobs and Islamophobia, then those are the barriers we need to tackle. And I keep going back to this. It has to be about choice, giving the opportunities for those people who want to exercise their choice to be part of either education or the workplace. 
And I think it's really important for us to dig deep into this. Of course, look, I've had challenges mm. growing up, both internal and external. There were people who felt that uh, Muslim women shouldn't be going to university back in the 70s and 80s. I remember when my parents made a decision for us to go to university, there were members of the conservative communities around us who felt that it was inappropriate mm. for my father to be doing this. But at the same time, I know that when I went on to qualify as a lawyer, uh, you know, I was told that uh, being a lawyer was probably not the easiest place to be a working class Asian Muslim girl. Uh, and so I think people will always make judgments about you. They will limit you. But the one thing that I don't want Muslim women to be doing is self-limiting. And I do want them to believe that if they have choices, then they have to fight to be what they want to be, even if it feels that it's going to be tough. So are you, are you a naturally optimistic person, given everything else you've sort of spelled out? Um, are, you, are you then left optimistic about the future? I mean, in terms of young British Muslims and you know, the, 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 the politics and society and challenges that they face? I'm realistic, but there is no option but for us to remain optimistic. Mm. I think it's tough. I think in many ways there are challenges that young British Muslims are facing uh, more acutely uh, in, in a way that maybe as young British Asians we didn't. I think the form of racism that I faced as a young person was quite overt. It was the being chased after school, it was being called the P name. You knew when you were dealing mm. with a racist, mm. you, they almost, you, know, you could almost identify them from the way that they looked and the way that they dressed. I think it's much harder to identify an Islamophobe. They can come in the most respectable of settings. They can be in good suits. They can have a good Oxford education. It doesn't stop them from being a bigot. And therefore, I think uh, young people these days may find that that kind of covert Islamophobia is much harder to deal with than the overt stuff. And you can see my full interview with Baroness Saida Varsi on the ITV News YouTube channel. And if you're already watching this on YouTube, you can find a link to it in the description below. Baroness Varsi raised some pretty interesting uh, points there. What about that last one she made about sort of the, when she was growing up, you know, the racism or Islamophobia was much more in your face. It was people mm. chasing you down the street and mm -hmm. lobbing, you know, stones in your house. Whereas now it's much more opaque. It's much more subtle. Does that, does mm. that bring a... I'd struck a chord with you? Yeah, I definitely identify with that. I think people are a lot... I think that sort of in-your-face aggressive mm. racism has kind of... is, is frowned upon now. Mm. Mm. Whereas now, people will dress up their Islamophobia, their bigotry as mm. freedom of speech, mm. alternative ideas. Mm. <laughs> but it's the same thing. Do you... What about... Do, yeah. you, do, you, do you... Did that strike a note with you? Definitely. Like, even the story I, uh, I mentioned before, that's just an example where they're not going to say blatantly, you know, we just don't want a Muslim or whatever, they're just going to be like, oh, we're just not sure if her image is going to resonate with our... Or in other words, it's like, we just don't want you wearing a hijab on the cover of anything. <laughs> or politely avoid your emails or... Exactly, your, yeah. yeah. And I, I was so ignorant to it because I grew up a little confident young woman. I'm like, yeah, no, I've never experienced none of this. And everyone likes me. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, OK, actually, maybe I need to start opening my mind and um, not be so naive and accept that it is... Yeah, it does happen. Are young British Muslims politically engaged, do you think? I and mean, we talk about sort of breaking the mould. I mean, it's been a very, very difficult political atmosphere the last 10, 15 years. You know, when you talk about, you know, the people who follow your music or follow your sort of fashion or come to your shows, Tez, I mean, do you find that they're politically engaged more, do you think, or, or, or not? More than before? Or? Yeah, more, or do you think, do you think people are interested, young British Muslims are interested in politics or have they just been put off? By I think there are certain areas of politics that Muslim people are very, very interested in. Mm. For example, foreign affairs. Mm. I think young British Muslims mm. have a real vested interest in some of those things mm. based on some of this country's foreign affairs. Mm. What I'd like to see is young British Muslims have a more, have more focus and interest in local politics mm -hmm. because that affects our real lives. Mm. Yeah. What is happening in the NHS? What is happening in local government? Mm. Mm. Why is there so many potholes in your roads when you're driving? Yeah. Mm. Those are the sorts of things that I would love British Muslims to get involved with because mm. those are the sort of things yeah. we can actually make a difference in. Mm. Yeah. Um, and uh, in terms of um, trying to sort of um, encourage or you know, advise you know, young British Muslims who may want to be a stand-up comedian or, 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 or a model. How can, how, what's the best way do you find of, apart from doing the things you're doing, to encourage them to sort of pursue those kind of 
mold breaking careers? Just not having fear and just doing it, mm. literally just doing it. Mm. The best way for you to become good at something is just doing it. And even if you're not good initially, you will want. Mm. The more you do it, you'll progress and become better, but just yeah. keep doing it. Yeah. Do you know what? I can sometimes be called a dream killer, but um, I do it with the best mm. intention. I feel like you have to look at what you're really good at and what you enjoy doing and put them together. There are mm. certain careers that I might say, like, I love playing football. I'm not going to be a footballer because I'm not that good. Mm. <laughs> and yes, I could practice for the rest of my life, but I just feel mm. like life is too short to sometimes um, try to fulfill or pursue a career that's just not in your destiny. I think mm. it's so important to have intuition as well mm. and to just be as much as you can dream. I, I dream very big. Sometimes mm. people say it's unrealistic, but there's still that element of understanding. I know I can achieve this because I'm good at it and I enjoy doing it. So I think there has to be some mm. some element of, of just being the best version of yourself. Absolutely. I think it's okay. Sorry, I was just going to say, but I think it's okay to dream big and mm. to, to be unrealistic. There's one um, speaker that I like to listen to, and he said that if your dreams don't scare you, mm. then they're not big enough. Yeah. Nice. Very good. Very yeah, I mean, the reason I got into stand-up comedy is so it's a shortcut to become the first ever Asian Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to happen, but if you I reach never the know, stars, so I know. might hit the moon. You know, you but I think what young people have today that we didn't have necessarily growing up is social media. Mm. Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Absolutely. And that is making stars of people. So Absolutely. if there's a thing that you're really, really good at, showcase it on there yeah. and be an audience for it. There's so many fashionistas, mm. um, sketch comedy, music that, that, that comes through those channels. Mm. Absolutely. And we didn't have that growing up. I think Soldier Boy changed the game. Yeah. I'll be honest. When you look at social media, he's the one who actually set the example of saying, I'm not relying on the bigger label. entities mm. or labels to mm. sign me. Mm. I'm going to show them that I can make my own music and my own videos. And then from there, YouTube became the platform where everyone, if you want to if you want to put something out there, it's got to be a certain quality now. It can't just be you in your bedroom anymore. Yeah, I mean, there are so many people who earn really good money yeah. from showcasing their work online, Ooh, online that I would never have heard of because it's just not. Okay, well, listen, talking about sort of uh, show, showcasing, uh, before we go, we asked someone to turn the camera on herself as she tries to turn her passion into a career. Suhaima Manzur Khan is a rising talent whose Poetry Slam competition performance has now been seen two million times. The 23-year-old poet from Leeds tells us how her work is now taking her to places she never expected to go. I'm Sahima Manzul Khan. I am a spoken word poet, a speaker and a writer. And right now I'm heading to the train station in Leeds to get a train to London, which is a big part of my weekly routine actually, because I perform a lot of poetry and go to events in London. Um, but I do love living in Leeds and it's my home and um, actually I kind of resent the fact that everything is in London especially for young creatives and especially as a young Muslim because Leeds actually does have its own huge Muslim population and uh, I kind of think of Leeds and Bradford as conjoined because that's where my grandparents moved to when they migrated to England. But I'm going to an award ceremony tonight which is for Outspoken um, Performance Poetry Prize. So I'm now on Oxford Street heading to the um, 2018 Outspoken London Poetry um, Award Ceremony. Um, I've been shortlisted for the performance category for my performance that I did at the Round House last year. So that's quite exciting. Reduced to proving my life is human because it is relatable. Valuable because it is recognisable. But good GCSEs, family and childhood memories are not the only things that count as a life. Living is. So this will not be a Muslims are like us poem. I refuse to be respectable. Instead, lovers when we're lazy. Lovers when we're poor. Lovers in our back-to-backs, council estates, depressed, unwashed and weeping. Lovers high as kites, unemployed, joyriding, time-wasting, failing at school. Lovers filthy, without the right colour passports, without the right sounding English. Lovers silent, unapologising, shopping in Poundland, skiving off school, unsure, homeless, sometimes violent. Lovers when we aren't athletes, when we don't bake cakes, when we don't offer our homes or free taxi rides after the event, when we're wretched. So I'm back home in Leeds. Uh, it's the next day after the awards ceremony. I didn't win, um, but I did get to perform, which was really awesome. Um, I think it's actually the first time I've performed that poem this year, so I really enjoyed the response. And I think, as with all poetry events, when you don't win, you don't lose. So I'm at Heathrow Airport now. I've flown here this morning from Leeds, and now I'm going to be flying to Las Vegas, which I think is hilarious. I never thought I'd have a reason to go to Las Vegas. Um, 
but I've been invited to a conference. It's kind of a mixture of music festival and a TEDx conference with political and social activism goals, as far as I understand. Um, but yeah, I've been invited to perform my poem, This Is Not A Humanising Poem, um, based on the fact that it was seen on the internet by the organisers and they invited me. And I'll also be doing a speech. So I'm very excited. Um, and this is just completely not the way I would have planned to be spending my April um, one year ago. Uh, this year has been completely unexpected and I think this is probably the epitome of it. Las Vegas. Manzoor Khan, I think there's a new and different way of covering the lives of young British Muslims and that's what we're going to try and aim to do on this program. Thanks to my guests, Mohammed Yahya, Maria Idrisi and Tez Ilyas for joining us. You've been great and um, see you at the next time.